Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yannick Lejac. I'm a technology reporter for NBC News, and uh, I also write about games and other fun stuff for places like Kill Screen, The Wall Street Journal, and The Atlantic. Um, games for Change asked me to introduce Eric's talk today, Eric Zimmerman's talk, and I was very honored to, to have this opportunity. And for those of you who have already seen Eric speak, uh, he can probably do more justice to his very impressive background than, than I can in a few short minutes. So I just wanted to give a little personal anecdote to tell why I'm excited to present him and his work, given the impact that he's had on my work. Um, I've been writing about games professionally for about two years at this point, and that's pretty much just enough time to realize that I don't really know that much about games yet, and there's a lot left to learn about it, obviously. And whenever I approach a new field, particularly one as diverse as gaming right now, my first impulse as a writer is I want to just like try to read as much as humanly possible about it. So I asked a friend of mine who works at Ubisoft, actually, if he could recommend any material for me. And uh, the first thing he said in an email to me was he just said, go buy Rules of Play by Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salen. And then his exact words after that were, seriously, close this email and buy a copy right now. A few weeks after that, I found myself attending a playtesting session for Eric's board game, Armada D6, at the NYU Game Center, where he's a faculty member. Seeing a prototype for a board game might not sound like the most unique experience to some of you, but a lot of my work writing for an outlet like NBC is usually focused on the kind of biggest and brightest uh, elements of the commercial game industry. So I spend a lot more time writing about games like Call of Duty and Farmville than I can the kind of experimental work that someone like Eric is doing. So kind of going from seeing just like these very tightly polished previews of like big explosions and assault rifles and grenade launchers to then seeing like someone, a very passionate independent game developer and game designer and artist working with these raw materials of gameplay was very inspiring to me. And to close this, I just wanted to highlight this quote that I found very inspiring from an interview that Eric recently did for Polygon. We said, I didn't want to do big, heavy 3D mainstream games. I didn't want to do this kind of client-based advert gaming work. I wanted to do small-scale games. He added a moment later, I really wanted to create a context where I could work on original, experimental, innovative games. So please join me in welcoming Eric Zimmerman. for that uh, uh, very kind introduction. And um, hello, everybody. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what I have to say. Um, I, I really want to really um, thank the organizers of Games for Change, um, everyone who's been a part of the excellent sessions that I've attended, and, uh, and um, all, all of you for coming today. Um, I really also want to thank, uh, in addition to Asi and Michelle, Suzanne Segerman, who had the vision 10 years ago to create what is now a really incredible and impressive organization. Thank you, Suzanne, wherever you are. I would want to give you a, a shout out. So um, here is my, uh, here's my talk. Uh, it's called Games Are Not Good For You. Um, now, I was, I was, oh, and uh, just to give you a quick sense of who I am, um, the, I've worked on digital games, and as Yana said, I like to focus on unusual experimental games. Uh, one in the middle was uh, a game about play and meditation for the Kinect. Um, I ran a studio in, for 10 years in New York City called Game Lab um, uh, that I co-founded with Peter Lee. Uh, I am an academic now. Uh, I am a faculty, a professor at the NYU Game Center. I've written a few books like uh, Rules of Play with Katie Salem that Giannis mentioned. Um, I also have worked doing educational games or games for learning, although it's not the, necessarily the focus of my work. My company, Game Lab, made GameStar Mechanic originally, um, which is now run by Institute of Play and Eline. Uh, and in fact, Game Lab created the Institute of Play. We spun it off as a nonprofit sister company. Um, and uh, kudos to Katie Salem for all the great work she's done, done with it. Um, uh, recently, I've been doing these uh, uh, games for physical spaces with an architect, Natalie Potsi, 
uh, and uh, they've been shown in museums and festivals and galleries. They're large-scale games that you play uh, with other people. Um, so let's get to the talk, though. Um, enough about my work. I, I, I'll see if Michelle asked me to come here and help end the conference so sort of by challenging you. Um, and I want to maybe propose that there's a problem with the, our field today, with, with the idea of games and social change, games and learning, with a cluster of practices happening here around design, research, policy, scholarship, politics, activism, and education. Now, we love games, and I, I think it's probably safe to say that. We're not just game researchers or, or educators or activists or developers. We're here because we're also game lovers. Um, we play games, we grew up with games, or maybe recently fell in love with them. We talk about games, we dream about games. We make games an integral part of how we earn our living and spend significant parts of our lives. Um, but if we love games, um, I think it's possible that we're mistreating them. We're just not treating them with respect. And I want to convince you that there's a need for a shift in how we think about games, not just in terms of uh, games and social change or learning, but globally. Um, and as a symptom of this problem, uh, here's a panel, a highlighted panel, from the American Educational Research Association from a couple of years ago, but I think it applies possibly even more so today than it did back then. Um, this was the uh, description of this plenary panel. Um, and uh, as you can see, the debate was about whether computer games are a useful medium for student learning, um, or the other side of the debate, is that whatever could be learned from them might be done uh, more economically by other means. Now, <laughs> I feel like this abstract speaks for itself. Um, I, didn't, I didn't attend this session, but from looking at the transcripts and talking with those who did attend, uh, it seems like it delivered on everything that you might expect. It focused on games as carriers of information about whether games can translate content and whether they're as efficient as other uh, media or cultural forms of doing so. And so this is how top researchers are representing uh, games and how games are being represented to the larger educational community. I think this is a problem. Um, this is a slide that I took, uh, put into my talk inspired by Ian Bogos, who used the same slide, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, just to hammer home the point, um, this is a Fast Company article from last week. Um, and you know, the, there's a question about why do we ask this of games? Why do we say that a game has to change the world, right? Do we ask for these same effects from, say, a documentary film, a social change film? Um, a, docu a documentary film can explore a topic, raise awareness, tell a story, but in games there's a tendency to idealize possible effects beyond all uh, concept con uh, forms of reality. Uh, it's like the idea that a medical simulation for training doctors is also going to cure cancer. Um, this is a problem. Now, we love games, but as, as game lovers, how do we treat the objects of our affection? Compare, for example, something outside games. Let's take a look at books. Um, if we were book lovers, I, I think many of us probably, probably are book lovers, um, passionate about books and learning, dedicating our careers to books, would we spend our time trying to prove how great books are, or how educational books are as engaging as non-educational books, whatever that might mean? Would we make book-based curricula, advocate for book-based learning or better and more educational books? Would we spend our time trying to figure out the right formula for better, more effective books, or try and convince people that books can change society or change the world? Be actively trying to bookify the world? Um, the whole idea of educational books, or maybe books for change, is strange. And uh, it's funny, Ian also used that same uh, phrase in, in, in his talk a couple nights ago. Now, there are some educational books. There are textbooks and reference books, but they're just a sliver of how books impact, direct, and engage learning and impact people's lives. So most of us studying books and learning, or books and education, or books and social change, would be less concerned about building the perfect book and more concerned about how books can be part of larger educational processes. Uh, in other words, do the storytellers out there, do you want to be making the textbooks uh, uh, of games? Do the filmmakers out there want to be making the instructional videos of games? We should want games in people's lives the way books are in people's lives. Um, but think about how books are in schools, for example. They're not just vehicles for injecting content. They're part of learning, part of being an educated person, a literate person, a good person. We don't study how books 
make you learn, how they change your brain chemistry, for example. Instead, we, we study and strategize reading, learning, the classroom, schools, these contexts where books are best deployed in, in a wide variety of educational situations. And that kind of bigger idea is closer to what, what education or what educating is, and, and an experience that, that might lead to the kind of impact that you want games to have. Um, we're, we're in danger of instrumentalizing games, turning something that's rich and complex and ineffable into a blunt tool for a narrow utilitarian purpose, strip mining the games that we love in order to harness them and, and for, for, for dubious ends. Um, uh, there's, there's a problem when games are only valuable for what they can do outside themselves. When the games become saddled with something, uh, with becoming the instrument for solving every problem that they wish to explore or think about or play with. And, and this is instrumentalization. Um, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, give you one quick example from my own work. I'm certainly part of the problem, I think, that I'm talking about. Um, it's a, a case study of cautionary tale. Um, this was a project I was working on a few years ago, a building size game for a new building about the US Senate uh, in Boston. Um, it was a design I was working on collaboratively with Karen Seidman and Dylan McKenzie, where players became senators of a particular historical period for about an hour, and they voted on issues and, and traded influence with each other. Um, they, they joined committees, and they debated issues with each other in a kind of theater card game of point and counterpoint. And the experience emerged out of them kind of socializing, strategizing votes that were good for, for them personally, for their party, for their constituency, and trying to negotiate all the conflicts uh, between those, uh, between those um, possible ways for them to, to, to succeed in the game. Now, we started with a game inspired by its subject matter, developed for a particular audience in particular context, and we were teasing out a new kind of game mechanic that was creating an amazing context for understanding the process of the Senate, the US Senate. And as we made the game, in parallel, we were investigating what ways it, it would be educational, how it could be deployed with players. And there's a beautiful kind of design emerging out of this process. Um, and then, something happened. The project changed hands. And looking at our design, the design we had made, the new client who had sort of taken over, uh, managing it, they didn't see all the educational stuff that they were used to seeing. So their solution was actually to take out the game. And they put in educational stuff. They put in uh, writing assignments, a focus on learning testable historical facts. And this got rid of all the stuff that made them nervous, um, like the idea of players being competitive with each other, or uh, making a suggestion that the Senate is less about the, uh, the idealized issues-based version and more about actually horse trading votes, which it actually is. We were actually basing uh, our game materials on scorecards that senators themselves use to keep track of how votes are trending um, and, and, and uh, uh, on a particular issue. Um, and, um, uh, or, uh, or, or not really knowing exactly what the experience of each individual student was going to be. Actually, Katie, this morning in the panel, made this great uh, picture of a playful classroom and a, and a less playful classroom. And we were definitely going for that, that kind of playful classroom experience even outside the classroom. Um, but, but they literally said to us, uh, now that we have our educational components in, in, in place, after they had kind of ripped the guts out of our, the, our core game experience, um, and, uh, and they took it out, they said, now we just need to figure how to get that fun game stuff back in there. Um, and I, I reached for my revolver, but I, luckily I don't know it again. Um, and you know, the question is, what is wrong with, with that picture, that approach? that although the idea was to engage kids with the game as a centerpiece of this museum experience, there was no understanding of games, no trust of games. The gameplay at its best is complex and messy, improvisational and, and wonderful, and, and by editing out all of that wildness of games, it, in a sense, you kill the patient. Now, the actions of, of this new client on this Senate game is a symptom of broader cultural movements in thinking about education. And so the good and bad about games and learning and, and social change that I'm discussing is taking place in a, in a context of a shift in public policy towards testing. And I, I think that there have been plenty of other people ranting about this at this conference about how standardized testing is, is dragging education back to the 19th century. And I, I don't think I have to talk about that. But I, what I do want to say is that games, in a sense, are the cultural form of testing. You could say that any quiz is already a game. 
So the ability for games to fulfill the kind of quantification dreams of, of, of people that are really behind testing as a form of education is dangerous, which, which brings us to gamification. So in this context of a shift towards testing, gamification, making use of the superficial aspects of games, like points and levels, in order to better engage and manipulate an audience, is something that to me is often disturbing and, and dangerous. It's basically a kind of marketing approach that instrumentalizes games. Um, so the question is, what's wrong? What, what's really wrong with it, right? Well, um, I think that the, for me, uh, there's plenty of critiques of gamification, but the aspect that, that disturbs me most is that, in, in my mind, every game implies its player. It builds an implicit model of what it means to be human by virtue of the way that the game is structured, and, and propagates that idea into the world. So the gamified idea of what it means to be human uh, based on a kind of behavioral psychology is just severely impoverished. And that if games are an important cultural form, the kinds of cultural works that result from gamification are, are a sort of perverse pedantic culture, like ideological theater coming out of an Eastern Bloc totalitarianist regime, um, marketing schemes masquerading as grassroots uh, movements. Um, but, but whether or not we, have, we, we support or oppose gamification, the truth is that games are going to happen. They are, they are, in my opinion, going to be the, the most prevalent and, and, and important cultural form, no matter what any of us in this room do. So the danger, the danger is that we're going to miss out, that, that, the, that games and learning, that games and social change are going to become irrelevant, and that the people in this room will, will follow instead of leading what happens with games. When in fact, the opportunity exists for the people here, all of you, to create the new paradigms for being educated, for being literate, for being cultured, really for being human for the next 100 years. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Um, to understand what's at stake, I think we have to appreciate the, 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 the incredible relevance of games uh, today. In other places, I've made an argument for, for games being a kind of dominant form of culture or model for culture for the coming century that I call the ludic century. And the fact is that games, games do have a special relevance to the times that we're in. And, and the opportunity that we stand to lose is not just about people in this room sort of debating a disciplinary niche. Um, at the, at we, games are going to be the defining cultural form of the next century, and, and we have to do better. So, so thinking in terms of big epics, let me, let me try and explain this concept a little bit. Um, the, the 20th century saw the industrial age replaced by the information revolution. The question on my mind is what's next, right? What, what's, what's the time that we're in now? And I want to argue that we're entering, or that we have entered, a ludic age. That the information age, in a sense, has been put at play. That the 20th century was the age of information, with the moving image as a dominant paradigm for art, entertainment, and leisure. Um, of course, there were, there were plenty of other important forms of culture in the 20th century, music and architecture, uh, theater, um, but in terms of cultural narratives, from, from news and history to personal expression and storytelling to our biggest epic cultural myths, the moving image was, was, uh, was a dominant form of, of expression. Now, the, the 21st century, in a similar way, is going to be a big, messy stew of cultural forms, but games, I think, are going to become more and more important, even though games are ancient now, they, they, they have this new, new relevance. They're going to become a model for how we think about culture. And this idea of the ludic century is an argument about literacy, about the skills necessary to be successful in the coming century. So literacy is, is about making and understanding meaning, right? In the simplest sense, I write down a word and you read it, or maybe I, let me back up a couple, I, I put a word on a slide, I've, I've created language, you guys can read it, that's, that's, what, that's what literacy is about, and, and uh, uh, creating and understanding meaning. And literacy is expanded from its more classical roots to involve visual literacy and technological literacy. Um, my argument is that the ludic century, there's a new cluster of literacies um, surrounding gaming um, that, that, that represent this age. And I'm not saying that there's an implicit, essential connection between these emerging forms of literacy and games, but I do feel that games are one of the best ways of understanding them, and that the relevance of games in our culture is cause and effect of these literacies. So, so the first, there's three components I want to talk about. Systems, play, and design. So, 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 so many, so systems is just really important in our lives today in a way that they weren't a few decades ago, right? That so many aspects of our lives are intertwined 
with, with systems. Um, the way that we work and, and learn, the way that we communicate to each other, the way that we, that we socialize and flirt and romance, the way that we conduct our finances, the way that we connect with our governments, all of these very essential aspects of our lives are completely uh, intertwined with, with systems, digital networks of information. Um, and, um, and, um, and games, in a sense, I would argue, are the cultural form of systems. Now every building is a system, every poem is a system, but to play a game is really to tinker in a mechanical way with the inputs and outputs of a system. What, what happens if I do this? How, how does the system respond to my action? So a game is kind of a laboratory for learning about systems and, and how systems work. Um, but, but systems are enough, right? Um, um, because you, you can't explain a game just by looking at its system analytically. Um, that doesn't explain play, right? So in, in the panel this morning, um, they talked about Minecraft, all the amazing things that teachers are doing in Minecraft in classrooms. You can't look at the system, the code of Minecraft, and, and, and anticipate all of the things that would happen with the game, just like you can't look at grammar and, and extrapolate to Shakespeare or the, or the Bill of Rights. Um, so play is the, the human element of a system, right, that, that takes the system and, and, and does something with it, with it as it bubbles over with human activity. Now to connect this to literacy, what I mean is that, you know, the, the model for literacy in systems past was about knowledge being produced by experts and being disseminated to, to make a broad generalization. But, but, but getting, uh, learning information, learning facts, for example, today is less about going to a library or, or, or even going to, going to an encyclopedia that you might have at home, and, and it's Wikipedia, which is increasingly the prevalent way that people do their kind of quick you know, first, first instinct research on something. Wikipedia is not a community where experts are disseminating knowledge to, to an audience. It is a, it, it's a system in which the lines between the, the producers and consumers of information are blurred. It, it's a messy system, it's a human system. And in fact, even the way in which those roles are defined themselves evolve over time as they change their, their policies for editing and, and, and policing themselves. So, so play is that human system. It's that thing that, 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 that bubbles over with the, with the, the kind of unexpected creativity and, and play and, and, and innovation. Um, so the third aspect of these uh, ludic century literacies uh, or uh, components of uh, being literate in the ludic century is design. Um, design means solving problems, but, but in a particular way. It means seeing the world as constructible, as problems to be solved. It's not enough to be playful. Um, we must understand that we have, we have the power to change systems, think about problems, and make them better. And for me, when Jim G this morning was saying, we need to learn to think like designers, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the kinds of dilemmas that face us in the 21st century, environmental collapse, world poverty, pandemics, uh, cultural change, these are systemic problems that need to be understood as a complex set of interacting elements. Simple narratives about, for example, good people uh, you know, invading a bad person's country just in order to fix them are just not enough, um, even though such narratives often have guided American foreign policy for, for, for decades. Um, but we, we need to understand these things as complex systems. We need to think innovatively and playfully about them. We also need to see them as systems that we can redesign and change and make them better. So, so these are the three components of what I call gaming literacy. And again, I'm not saying that everything in the future is going to be a game, or even that games are the only way of, of acquiring or understanding these literacies. But these are what it will take to be literate and successful in the future, and games are the cultural form that in my mind, more than any other cultural form, engenders these literacies. And the opportunity we have to use games to help shape the future of education is, is profoundly important. Now, th this is very common to things like 21st century literacies and other ideas that are floating in the atmosphere. Um, so I, I, I don't imagine that I'm kind of making up uh, these ideas all on my own. But, but if you agree with this point of view, if you agree with this, set of views that are kind of floating around the, the, the cultural, the intellectual landscape today. In this context, instrumentalizing games as vehicles for injecting content into players just seems so misguided. That, that kind of thinking is less and less relevant as our century moves forward. It's like teaching typesetting to graphic designers. Um, we need broader rubrics for thinking about games in society as activists and educators and, and scholars and researchers. And I, I'm gonna say something that many of you may disagree with, but I do not believe that we can, should, can or should 
reduced games to their measurable effects. And this is, this is for me like reducing cuisine to nutrition. Um, so any chef would take offense at that idea, right? That the, the experience of cuisine, imagine your, your favorite restaurant, right? Um, it, it, it's a thousand things. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the interior design and lighting. It's the social experience of sitting down with with friends, it's the it's the aesthetics of the the chef and the presentation of the food. In addition to its its of course its taste and and its smell and and, and texture, it's the it's the cultural references that the, that a particular menu might make as it mixes or remixes mixes existing cultures. It's the innovation within within multiple disciplines like like restaurant entrepreneurship or or, or just cooking itself. Um, and um, of, of, you know of, of um, and, um, and 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 so. Uh, in a sense, the, the experience of cuisine is, is a, it's a thousand different things, and nutrition is an important aspect of them. Um, but 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 in, but too often, I think games for change, in essence, reduce cuisine to nutrition. And of course, you can say, well, this is what this is what has to happen, right? Um, that that it's that it's necessary to restrict the domain of how we consider games in order to to have impact, right? We need to measure that impact and then make sure it really happened. But but. Um, but, uh, but, but I think that, again, we're doing so to the detriment of, of solving the problems that we know are out there, of, of somehow uh, uh, bringing the games that we love uh, into, into uh, step with the ludic century that we're in. Um, now, while I'm making enemies here, um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about game design itself, game design. Educational design and social game design. And there's, I think that there's one. If I really think about what's what I, the biggest problem with design itself, um, uh, I, I, I would call it design literalism. Um, and you know, I, I think that I, I think that we all know that. And it was funny in Lee Alexander's talk last night. She kind of made a side comment like, "Well, you know, the reason why all educational games are bad are, and there's a sort of a." A murmur over the audience. Did she just say, "Yeah"? Because there's, there's a, out, she comes from outside this world, and there's a, there's a kind of generally accepted sense that, 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 the, that the games aren't good, um, and, um, and you know, somehow that's true. That if we, that if we compare games designed for social change to, to games in, in general, the, 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 the games just don't seem as fun, as beautiful. They just don't feel like they're fulfilling their promises and, and potential as games. And I think more than anything, there's a problem with literalism. So I just want to assert that games do not need to literally simulate or depict their subject matter to do justice to it. Um, that, 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 so you shouldn't think that games need to depict their topics directly, or even worse, to simulate the outcomes in the game that you want to have happen in the world. Um, I was part of an initiative uh, that was about kids staying in school. And, and, um, and I was working with uh, PBS and some other people and developing a concept and design for this. And the group ended up designing a, a game that, that was a virtual high school that, 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 that kids attended the high school in the game. And the kids were rewarded for staying in the virtual high school and being good and staying in school. And, and of course, you know, it, 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 it just never made it past the concept stage. But this was kind of the worst sort of literal flat-footed, unimaginative thinking. If you want to make a game to keep kids in school, don't make a game about school where they get rewarded for staying in school. There are already games that keep kids in school. Marching band competitions, chess club, team sports. So if you want to put digital games in school, it better invest your time have creating a StarCraft team, making a league with other high schools in the area. Um, rather than trying to invent the outcomes that you want to see. We've all seen games that suffer from this kind of design literalism, and I've been responsible for some. I think the antidote is to trust games more. Recognize that a successful game has to be capable of uncertain outcomes. It's part of what makes a game a game. You shouldn't try to tightly control what a game player learns. Um, and, and don't saddle the game with representing within the game what you want to see out in the world. It's this weird kind of desperate wish fulfillment. It's instrumentalism on the level of concept design. Although I think that it plays extremely well to funders and foundations and journalists, and that's why we keep on seeing it. Um, in, instead, we need to embrace expanded ideas of play and see games as a place, a context, a, a, an occasion for the exchange of ideas. And I think that we, we have seen some excellent speakers talking about this. Even Jessica Hammer, just here on stage, has a, a very different idea 
than the instrumental idea of, of how games can, can fit into a, a context. So as we think deeply about games, we need to do the opposite of reduction. We, reducing them to nutrition. We need to see games in all their grandeur and joy. We need new ways of looking at games, bigger inclusive games for uh, frames for considering how games and social change interact. Not just for learning and education, but really games in general. And I think the good news is that there's not just one correct big idea here. There are multiple correct, exciting ways to, to look and reinvent the way that we're thinking about games. And I just want to uh, uh, end by, by thinking about one, one possibility. Games as aesthetic objects. So, so rather than thinking of games as learning vehicles that transmit information, or even deeper cognitive skills, or social learning, is thinking of them as cultural works, as works of beauty. So, so again, this doesn't mean that I'm trying to, to lift games away from being context for social change. It's the opposite. I'm trying to rescue them. I'm trying to midwife them into a more interesting space. So I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you three examples from outside games, from, from, from visual art. Works that function as aesthetic objects and engage with the idea of social change, but not in the flat-footed, literal way that our games too often do. So, so these images are from the work of Edward Burtnitsky, a photographer who's become known for his massive photographs of industrial landscapes. And there's a great documentary, Manufactured Landscapes, uh, about his work. Um, this is an image from Southeast Asia, where steel ships are dismantled for, for scrap. This is a, a clean factory in China. Um, and this is a, a beautiful red river of industrial waste um, that, that he's photographed. And, and these images, if you've ever seen them, are, are huge. I mean, they're often uh, 12 or 20 feet uh, across it. They're, they're massive, um, uh, um, spectacular works. Now, now I, I, I want to quote Edward a little bit, talking about how he, how he considers his work. This is a quote from him. And I think what's interesting is he, he talks about his work uh, as, as a sort of world that he wants viewers to enter. And he frames his artwork as something that moves from formal beauty to, to, a, to a scary image, to a forbidden pleasure, um, then to a kind of a, a political statement, and then um, uh, ultimately to a kind of a, a, whoops, a kind of moral uh, revelation. Um, on, a, on an earlier panel, a developer remarked, uh, I think it was on uh, the first day of the conference, that when it came to serious games, there were basically two approaches, simulation or satire. And I, I was struck by the kind of bitter honesty of this statement, and, and, and th there have to be other models, right? So Bernitsky's photos are not artwork with information to convey or a thesis to communicate. It's not a simple social is issue message propaganda or a neutral depiction of a system or, or simple satire. It, ambi it utilizes ambiguity and contradiction. And you know, I just want to point out that, that, that these images are one man's passionate and ongoing body of work, an investigation that he's been doing for years and decades. He's not a photographer who responded to a call for grants or a client who, was, who handed him a social issue and he said, oh, okay, I'll take some pictures of that. Um, this is really one man's passionate investigation of his work. And that's, again, we've heard a theme in these keynotes from, from Ian and Robin and, and Lee about doing work that, that, that comes out of a personal passion. Um, now, um, uh, these images, the next example I want to show you, uh, come from a manual used by protesters in Egypt during the, the, the 2011 uh, uprisings or demonstrations that are sometimes called the Arab Spring. Um, and, and in Egypt, the, 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 the standoff of the army that resulted in democratic reforms. And these were translated and, and republished in, in Atlantic Magazine. Um, so so um, in considering art in the visual art world, in, in, in recent decades, I don't really have time for a whole digression into art education, but I will say that, that art education doesn't just look at, at visual art, it looks at visual culture. Um, and I just wanted to say that thinking about games through the lens of art doesn't necessarily mean traditional museum art. Um, and, uh, you know, I, for me, these images are beautiful in, in so many ways. Um, this is showing you the, the, uh, the uh, outfits that, that, that you should wear for peaceful protests to protect yourself, for example. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the spray paint can is actually used uh, uh, tactically, um, for example, against, against riot police. It's spray paint. It's, not, it's, it's nothing toxic. Um, to, to spray in their faces or to get their helmets covered with paint. Um, so th th these images for me are, are beautiful as clean, efficient design, as utility, as an artifact from, from a moment in time. 
um, as an expression of people's desire for social change. And also just as, as beautiful visual objects. These are highlighting the, the best places to spray paint um, a, police, a police vehicle, um, the, the cameras and the windshields. Um, and you know, if, if you do want to make games that aspire to change, this is design that affected change, right? You, you don't need a, a, a fucking assessment study to figure that out in this case. Um, okay, I want to go to my final example of games as a, 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 a comparing games to, to, to aesthetic forms. This is Ai Weiwei, the, the, the uh, Chinese artist, dropping a Han Dynasty urn. And I recently saw his retrospective in, uh, in Indianapolis last week. Um, and so smashing a Ming vase, yes, he is in this series of photos destroying a, an ancient Chinese vase. And it, it's a reference to the Chinese government's destruction of historical objects. Um, but it's also, uh, it, it's also a genuine action in and of itself, right? Uh, I mean, this is not art that delivers a single simple message or seeks to have some kind of quantifiable outcome on the audience. It's disturbing, ambiguous, contradictory, but funny and sad and provocative all at the same time. I mean, it's, it's extremely, uh, every time I see this, I have that same, you know, kind of vertigo of emotion, emotional intellectual reactions to this work. Um, this is a kind of range of responses that Edward Nitsky wrote about in terms of what he's trying to produce for his viewers. And, and so I just want us again to think about, when we talk about impact, we're, we're almost never thinking about the kind of subtlety and complexity of impact that, that great art, for example, could have. What can we smash? Um, going to conclusions, I know I'm just, I'm just at time now. So uh, this is a challenge for all of us, for, for researchers and scholars, for educators, activists, funders, for designers and developers too. Are we thinking about our work as profoundly as we could be? What I want to point out again is that I think we need to shift how we think about games from vehicles for change or for learning to cultural aesthetic objects. Games are, are going to be the cultural form of our ludic century. They're going to forge ahead and roll forward no matter what we do. And I don't want us to miss the boat. Now, I'm going to give an anecdote from a Games for Change of a number of years ago. Alan Kay, a pioneering computer scientist who developed graphic user interface and object-oriented programming, kind of a personal hero. He unfortunately kind of missed the boat. At, at this Games for Change talk, he was talking about how games teach, and he mentioned at the end of his talk, Guitar Hero. And he lamented sadly that the game was not teaching music but to kids, but at least a few of them were getting interested in learning rock and roll guitar as a result. And, and I thought, now hold on a second, you know, at first that seems to make sense, but then you have to think, teaching rock and roll guitar is good? 50 years ago, it was seen as, as, as not only downright satanic, but responsible for the, the, the impending downfall of Western civilization. <laughs> but today, Alan Kay takes it for granted that playing music, studying music, making music, it's good. It's just part of being human. But playing a game, clearly a waste of time. Um, game designer Frank Lance has commented that in 50 years, there's going to be some other cultural form that the crazy kids are doing and that will be seen as lamentable and a waste of time. And people will say, you know, it's really a shame, but at least a few of them are getting interested in playing games. <laughs> Alan Kay never questions that music is part of being human. Games are part of being human too, like telling stories or making images. And this is my point. Let's break that cycle. Let's not be the ones to, to instrumentalize games. So this may have been a rant, but this is not a negative speech. This is a positive one. We have an opportunity, an opportunity to define games and rethink what learning is in the ludic century. It's not enough that we finally have government grants and recognition. We need to lead, not follow. We need to stop being so grateful to our funders, dancing their dance of superficial proof and shallow thinking. We need to be smarter than them. We need to educate them. It's time for us to stop being cheerleaders, and, and we need to be more critical and more dissatisfied with our own work, with games, with each other. A loving books shouldn't make you a cheerleader for books. It should make you a snob. It should, it should, it should make you like, like more books less. It should make you hate most books. We want to be game snobs. We want to be snobs like the kids and hardcore players that we're making games for. They're snobs. Why make games that no one will ever really want to play? It's not enough that the White House funded games about obesity. We need to be honest and tell the White House that, that it's kind of a literal-minded throwback uh, to, to, to ideas that are outdated already. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a victory. 
Games for change doesn't have to mean the textbooks and instructional videos of games. It can mean the critical paradigm for looking at games. So people working in games, not just learning in games, we're desperate for new paradigms. There's a recognized crisis, Lee Alexander will tell you. In journalism, for example, people don't know how to write about games or think about games, understand what games are and what they can be. We can be those people. We're the people in this room. We are thinking about the future to help def define and expand the cultural form of the next century. Here are my 10 challenges to you. Reject the instrumentalization of games. Expand our concepts, don't reduce them. Be wary of design literalism from designers or anybody else. Recognize what's at stake in the ludic century. Consider games as aesthetic objects, not simple propaganda, as one possible way of expanding them. Be impatient, not complacent. Be a snob. Challenge and educate each other, and be playful. And finally, I just want to end with an anecdote. A little while ago, I met Andrew Hiskins, who, te who leads what he calls the Learning Services at the State Library of Victoria in Australia. He's doing interesting, innovative work, and he told me that one recent workshop they had was about how students could teach the teachers. He met with children and was trying to get them uh, to, to help him understand how they could better teach the teachers about technology, about games, about their lives and their needs. At first, the students had trouble wrapping their heads around this inversion of the usual classroom dynamic, but soon they took to it, giving recommendations and strategies. As Andrew put it, one of the students told him, okay, we understand you now. We think it could be possible to teach the teachers, but first, they really have to want to learn. Thank you. <laughs>